Network. Uh, this network is funded by HRSA with over 100 active researchers across nine research nodes and a listserv membership of over 2,000 individuals and growing. Uh, we study how and when to intervene to improve children's long-term health trajectories. From a life course health development perspective, we acknowledge that families are a proximal, perhaps the most proximal influence on a child's development in those early years. And we believe that in order to improve children's health, we must also improve family health. We see this as an understudied area, and we're hosting this webinar series to bring together some various experts on families to help us think about how we can better support the health and well-being of families through our intervention research. Our focus today is on family resilience. What does it look like to build the resilience of families as systems rather than just individuals? Can family resilience impact family members' health and well-being throughout the life course? If so, how? And what are the limitations of viewing things from a resilience perspective? These and other things we'll be exploring today. Um, and it's actually my pleasure to introduce um, our two wonderful speakers. Um, first is Dr. Nastasia Hajal, who's an assistant clinical professor in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences and assistant director of uh, the Nathanson Family Resilience Center's Early Childhood Core. Dr. Hajal's research bridges basic science on developmental psychopathology, parenting, emotion, and neuroscience with clinical research on the promotion of family resilience in the face of stress. She has a particular interest in studying caregiver emotional processes and emotion regulation at the family level. Some of her current research projects include an NIH-funded RCT, examining caregiver emotion regulation, brain-based biomarkers of emotion in response to a preventive intervention in parents who have their own histories of childhood interpersonal trauma, as well as studies examining parenting, emotion, socialization, and response to preventive interventions in Latinx families. Dr. Hagel is also a licensed clinical psychologist who supervises clinical psychology and child psychiatry trainees in the UCLA Family Stress, Trauma, and Resilience Clinic, which focuses on the prevention and treatment of traumatic stress in children, adolescents, and their families. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Michigan and her master's and PhD from the Pennsylvania State University. And next we have Dr. Frama Walsh, who's an internationally respected clinical scholar and the Firestone Professor Emerita at the University of Chicago. She's also co-founder and co-director of the Chicago Center for Family Health. Dr. Walsh is the leading expert on family resilience with extensive experience and application with a range of adverse challenges involving trauma and loss, disruptive life events, and multi-stress conditions. Her research-informed family resilience framework is applied worldwide in research, clinical practice, and community-based services with at-risk youth and vulnerable families. Her collaborative systemic approach integrates developmental, relational, sociocultural, and spiritual perspectives. She's a valued consultant nationally and internationally for resilience-oriented training and practice. Dr. Walsh, a clinical psychologist, received her BA degree with honors in psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, a master's of social work degree at Smith College, and a PhD in human development and behavioral sciences at the University of Chicago. She is past president of the American Family Therapy Academy and past editor of the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy, and the recipient of many awards for her distinguished contributions to the mental health field. She has over 120 scholarly publications and some notable recent books, including Strengthening Family Resilience, now in its third edition, and currently in press, Complicated and Traumatic Loss, Fostering Healing and Resilience. So again, it's my pleasure to welcome our two excellent presenters. And just in terms of the format for the webinar today, each of our presenters are gonna have an opportunity to showcase some content on this topic of family resilience, taking about 10 minutes each. And then I will join with them and uh, kind of as a panel, explore these topics in more depth with each other, and then certainly turn to our audience for any questions. So if questions come up for you all, please feel free to insert those into the chat or otherwise document them. 
um, or raise them towards the end of our time together so that we can get into those questions. So I will now turn our time over to our excellent presenters, and I believe we will begin with uh, Dr. Walsh. It's a pleasure being here with you today, and I look forward to our conversation about family resilience. Uh, I've been working in this area uh, for several decades now um, as we tried to shift attention away from ways that families fail under stress to understand how they can succeed. And so my work has been uh, largely applying uh, and learning from um, the research in the field uh, across human development, across the clinical field that looks at stress coping and adaptation. And I was really drawn to um, the area of resilience um, because particularly in the clinical field, uh, there's a tendency uh, to overfocus on uh, problems and deficits, particularly in families and especially in mothers. And so my whole orientation has been to look at um, families under stress, but understand a little bit better uh, what are those processes in uh, relational transactions that can help us to overcome those obstacles and to succeed. So let me just show a few slides, a uh, very kind of a light um, look at uh, some of these perspectives, okay? Okay. Um, First of all, uh, to understand resilience, um, we have to deal with our larger cultural tendency to focus on the individual. In fact, over my career, it, I'm talking with colleagues, it's, it's difficult to get funding uh, for family research, and particularly if it's not problem focused. Um, so uh, we tend uh, all the time, there's a default to go back to the individual. And it's not surprising that the resilience research uh, began looking at individual traits. Uh, for children who manage to overcome uh, adverse conditions and family uh, factors uh, to go on and not just to survive, but to thrive. Um, and that kind of goes along with a, a, a cultural tendency um, to think about the myth of the rugged individual. We're all supposed to be uh, able to overcome challenges on our, on our own. Uh, we're invulnerable, tough, self-reliant, and um, it kind of fits as well with the macho image uh, that, that it's weak and shame laden, uh, particularly for men, but uh, it can happen to anyone um, to acknowledge need for help and be dependent. But what we learn from research as well as our larger um, uh, context worldwide is that human vulnerability and suffering is normal in adverse conditions. And so if whether it's intervention or whether we're doing research, it, it's helping uh, the families to find ways to cope and adapt in ways that they come in feeling that they are defective or there's something wrong with them or they've been diagnosed with problems uh, because they're having trouble managing highly stressful and sometimes very abnormal conditions. Secondly, is that as I surveyed the research uh, in the 80s uh, and the 90s, uh, we could see that uh, even though the focus was on individuals, that the importance of relationships came through and that resilience is nurtured in our relationships and our connections in communities and cultural and spiritual resources. Third, um, resilience science has moved from looking at personal traits or something that you're born with or you have inherently that enables you to cope and adapt to really look at multi-systemic processes uh, over time and to see these as recursive influences. So this larger systemic view fits very much with a family systems approach where I concentrate on the family at one level, understanding that this is always biopsychosocial. And last is that uh, 
these aren't, while some families are more vulnerable than others, um, the research really shows clearly that we can build resilience, not just through childhood and early adulthood, um, but some of my work has been in later life um, and seeing that, uh, that the, the neuroplasticity and the kinds of connections that we have that keep us vital um, also enable um, older adults uh, to thrive in uh, as they move through the life course. And that these, rather than thinking of them as fixed traits, um, if we think of them as interactional processes, that it's kind of an abstract way, but if we think of those as beliefs or belief systems, practices, skills, and supportive connections, that's really um, what it is that enables people um, to overcome their life challenges. The other common misconception of resilience is just bounce back. Because uh, when human um, systems, whether it's families, couples, or individuals, face crisis and chronic multi-stress conditions, there's going to be suffering, struggle, and setbacks. And this idea that you bounce back, that you, you just go back to normal, we've seen through the pandemic that that's really a myth because we need to adapt as conditions are changing or challenging and to construct a new normal, which again is very elusive to us uh, in our current um, uh, time and space with the pandemic and other uh, economic uh, sequelae. And finally, I guess I would say that resilience, if I were going to, to say what it involves, it's about struggling well. I think there's one misconception of resilience. It's that you uh, maintain high functioning through a crisis or through persistent challenges. And uh, to, in, in my reading and my experience, uh, that, that isn't just the way it works, that most often there's a dip down as people experience uh, adversity and it's coming back up, not only to their former level of functioning or um, uh, recovery, but really a positive growth that takes place. But what's involved here then is a reorienting of hopes and dreams when things can't be simply returned to and an integrating of the adverse experience and the resilient response into the chapters of life passage. Um, now, a family systems perspective uh, in looking at stressful challenges and adversity, we, we see how they affect all family members, their relationships, and family functioning of the family unit. And that multiple stressors, particularly recurrent or a pileup of stressors over time, compound distress. On the other side of it, family response, the way families approach a crisis or challenge, the way they respond in the aftermath can support resilience for children, for all members, for their bonds and for the family unit. And finally, that we also need vital resources beyond the walls of the family. We need to be connected to social and community resources and cultural, larger cultural, spiritual resources. And I would add here, because we won't have time, is we don't think about family resilience or individual resilience as this is how we're going to have people get through um, uh, very, very serious uh, life challenges, but we have to be looking at larger system changes at the same time. And as a systems, uh, thinker, uh, it's really a both and. It isn't, well, do we change systems or do we, you know, work and shore up individuals and families? We have to be doing both. Uh, maybe I have a couple more minutes. Uh, my work um, really then is showing how we can, through intervention programs that's that's grounded in and informed by research, build family capacities to overcome adversity. And what it involves is coping, adaptation, 
And what I think is, is most interesting in the concept of resilience, more than surviving, but regaining or gaining the ability to thrive. And that often period people experience positive growth. And in the discussion, you may want to uh, refer to that concept of uh, positive growth uh, in, um, that's in the individual uh, uh, literature. And so it involves working to strengthen bonds so that there is uh, more support uh, through tough times, becoming more resourceful through gaining skills, gaining practice in dealing with adversity and regaining that ability to thrive. Uh, so over uh, several decades, I developed a practice map to inform and guide our practice, community services, research, and social policy uh, that mostly identifies and strengthens uh, key family processes. Um, and I'd like to highlight that um, we've, we've come a long way in family systems work where we're not seeing it family therapy as a modality, where if you are thinking about the family, um, we can be working with individuals, with couples, with sibling subgroups. Um, we, we work in group settings. We work with community forums. And so that a family systems approach is really a conceptual orientation or framework that guides our work to be thinking about other influences, other potential resources as we're working with our clients. Um, okay. Uh, and partly it's uh, looking for individuals in relational networks can support, who can support, for instance, in a family that's quite vulnerable. It might be a single parent family lacking um, relational resources, and you have maybe an overstressed, under-resourced uh, mother, most often uh, raising children and limited financial um, at, uh, resources as well. What we want to do, even though we may not meet a larger family, is to assess uh, who might be helpful with emotional support or practical support in the kin and social network, and to also look through past uh, experiences of parents or of their family in inspiring their current efforts with their life challenges. So we listen for and we bring out stories of adver adversity and resilience. But fundamentally, when you think about family resilience, it's not simply the mother, even though she may be the primary or sole parent. We're looking at strengthening family functioning and who we can bring in to either the household or it may be across households to build a team effort. And uh, I won't have time today to go into this, but in my framework, uh, based on research over three decades, my own, but really the, the research literature as well, and from uh, extensive um, uh, clinical experience and uh, frameworks in the family systems clinical field, um, as well as the stress and coping literature, identifying nine key transactional processes or relational processes that um, come through in the various uh, research and uh, endeavors. And uh, I've uh, also constructed a, a, quest a questionnaire that's grounded in these nine key uh, that's used uh, widely, more internationally actually, uh, and has been translated in, into several languages. Uh, but I refer you to my publications if you're interested in understanding more what these processes are and how they can be um, uh, built or strengthened in uh, any kind of intervention. What I wanna mention finally is that, uh, uh, this comes from our uh, center, uh, Chicago Center for Family Health, over 30 years. Um, we built a number of uh, resilience-based programs that were in training for a mental health and paraprofessionals, uh, offering counseling services, and also community partnerships with agencies um, that were um, 
wanting to uh, work with families uh, that were in crisis. For instance, just as one example, uh, when a factory closes down or relocates and 1,800 people lose their jobs. And there in Chicago, there was a service uh, center to do retraining and help those individuals for reemployment. Uh, often low income or lower skill, often um, immigrant individuals, often sole parents. But what they, when they contacted us, they said, uh, we see that this period is highly stressful in the family, which is also making it more difficult for that individual who has to go through a prolonged period of transition into new employment. And they wanted to work with the family. Um, so we set up workshops that were convenient. We always try to assess with our partners um, what their resources are, uh, how we can support them, what would be convenient, and how would they best uh, show up and, and take advantage of these. So we use different formats. Um, we worked in a diabetes center, uh, again, with a larger um, uh, community forums uh, for families who had adolescents uh, with, with diabetes. Uh, so we work with a range of things from crisis, trauma, and loss. My area is um, a complicated and traumatic loss and bereavement. And I've worked with that throughout uh, my career. Uh, I've also done a lot of work with major disasters, uh, working with the pandemic. There's a, a publication in, in the references I'll refer you to. Working in war and conflict uh, related uh, adversity and with challenges for refugees um, and resettlement. Uh, we had one program with disruptive family transitions around separation, divorce. Other colleagues, uh, Celia Falikov, who is in San Diego actually, uh, is uh, the leading expert on working with immigrant families and transnational uh, families. Uh, Multi-stress persistent conditions. Dr. Roland, who is co-director of our center, works with illness and disability. Uh, he ran uh, groups for um, called Resilient Partners, uh, where one partner had multiple sclerosis and couples were challenged over time uh, with different kinds of issues coming up, emerging. Um, we've worked with uh, families living in low income, uh, neighborhoods, particularly with racial, ethnic uh, discrimination. And this approach is very good with at-risk youth and success. Uh, we set up family school partnership consultation groups that met month monthly and uh, became so successful that uh, Loyola School of Social Work <laughs> asked if they could incorporate it. And that's continued uh, to this day at a much wider scale. And finally, we did a two-year project uh, with the LA Mayor's Office uh, on gang prevention, positive youth development. And that, that's where we were training um, the uh, uh, counselors who often uh, had maybe a bachelor's degree level uh, and they weren't trained in therapeutic techniques, but really helping them with a resilience orientation more broadly to bring in uh, families as part of their multi-level approach to with a thousand, um, they were working with 1,000 youth who had been um, identified at high risk for gang involvement in neighborhoods that were very high risk for gang involvement. And uh, they were did individual um, counseling, peer groups. We added the family component and then they did community programs as well and mentoring. Uh, so that's where we see this as a potential for embedding in wider efforts, because sometimes programs that are community focused also involve the individuals, but they don't think about the family as really the missing link that can help to support both. Um, I think I'm probably over my time, <laughs> so I won't. I was going to mention the pandemic, but hey, Aren't we beyond that? No, we aren't. Um, so uh, let me just uh, mention my references here if anybody wants to take a screenshot quick before we go on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. Very much appreciate your presentation. So I think now we'll make a 
transition to Dr. Hijal. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. Um, Dr. Walsh, thank you for that presentation. It was so interesting to see. And let me share my screen. Um, what I'll talk a little bit about today um, is mostly an example of um, a, a family um, level um, preventive intervention program um, that I have been working with for the last many years um, with colleagues um, here at UCLA. And, um, but first I'm gonna start just with a little bit of how I sort of came to be really interested in family level work um, and, and sort of how, how my interest in family level processes really came about. So when I was a graduate student in, um, in child clinical psychology at Penn State, um, I was when I was first kind of doing my initial clinical work, I, I was working with a lot of children with um, anxiety disorders or externalizing behavioral disorders. And I really um, I really was sort of struck by the fact that even though um, parents and caregivers are involved in many of our interventions for um, child, child um, psychological disorders, a lot of them don't really um, consider the parents experience, um, internal experiences during the, um, the sort of parent-child interaction. So oftentimes we'll, um, you know, tell parents that it's very important to not accommodate their children's anxious behaviors or that they need to ignore their children's um, irritating behaviors, or if they need to set, set a consequence or do a timeout, they have to be very neutral when they do it. And that really, um, I, I think the missing piece is that parents have emotional responses to these situations with their children. I think especially to these situations with their children, right? If they're seeking out support for their children because they're having a lot of temper tantrums that are hard to manage, the family's probably gotten to the point where this is pretty emotionally evocative for the parents. So I was really interested in thinking about um, parent emotion, and emotion regulation. Um, so parents sort of process of what they're experiencing during parent-child interactions, but also how they are monitoring, evaluating, and modulating their emotional reactions. Um, so we know from the research literature that caring for children is emotionally evocative and that emotions and their regulation organize parenting behavior. Um, I have a bunch of citations. You know, we know this from a multi-method research, parental self-report, observations of parent-child interactions, psychophysiology of measurements of parents. Um, I could talk all day about this, but I won't go into it because I only have a few, a few minutes here. Um, but it was really sort of thinking about these processes, right? If we want to really help um, support a child's development, um, we really need to support um, all members of the family system um, and that all members of the family system are having their own internal experiences um, sort of happening simultaneously. And so in thinking about parental emotion, and this is just one example, right? When we're thinking about, as Dr. Walsh was saying, like family systems, look many different ways. Um, but if we're just taking this example, we have these sort of in the moment stressors or cues that might be having an impact on parental emotion. So if a child has some negative affect, reduced social reciprocity, specific challenging behaviors, behaviors that's triggering to the parent. And then that's all happening in the context of overarching stressors that the family might be encountering, right? Whether there are other caregiving supports, whether the family has the financial resources to meet their basic needs, whether the, the parent or caregiver has their own history of trauma um, or other adversity that may be impacting how they are able to engage with their child. So there are so many things, and this is just thinking about one parent and one child, right? When we kind of scope out to the Fam, the entire family system, it gets much more complicated. Um, so I became really interested in the idea of sort of taking a family-centered approach. Um, and, and that was one reason I felt so lucky to be able to come um, do my training 
um, with the UCLA Nathanson Family Resilience Center where they were um, really doing a lot of work in this, in this area. Um, so in terms of, you know, just why would we take a family-centered approach? Um, the well-being of a person and their families are inextricably linked. And I, you know, just gave this example of a parent and a young child, but this also has to do, you know, with couples or with siblings, um, any sort of combination of family members. We know that family members can play a significant role in enhancing or impeding another family member's recovery. Again, the example I just gave was, um, you know, a, a parent may having an impact on, on a child's course of treatment, um, but this can happen with, within any combination or combinations in, in a family system. That there's actually literature that shows that, that some families actually show a preference for family level services over individual services. And so they represent, it could really be an opportune point of entry for prevention and intervention efforts. For some, um, you know, adults who are caregivers, they are more likely to, to engage in services, you know, despite stigma or despite, you know, financial burden or scheduling burdens, if they feel like it will do something for their family. Um, so for these reasons, we take this approach. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is um, an intervention uh, called the FOCUS intervention is the acronym. It stands for Families Overcoming Under Stress. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the development and the research and evaluation support that exists for it. Um, but as you can see here, I just took some screenshots of um, a few different program manuals um, that we have here. Um, it was kind of initially developed for parents and caregivers of um, school-aged and adolescent children. Um, we now have um, a version um, for, for parents and caregivers of preschool and kindergarten age children. There's um, a model for couples. Um, and then this is our little feelings book for, for young children who participate. So I would say this sort of key thing that I would say to describe focus or that it's family centered. It is trauma or resilience informed um, and it's strengths based. So this is like really sort of, I think, it's a hugely important piece where we're not just focusing on what's problematic in the family structure. What are the risk factors? We're really looking at like, what does the family do really well? What are their resources? How have they actually shown strength in, in already getting through some of the, the adversity that they may have encountered? So we have real focus on this. And it's a skill building program. So it's um, very active, lots of different activities that are used to kind of introduce and practice um, skills. And so here are our five focus skills. I'll go into them a little bit in a minute, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, these skills, the reason that these particular skills were chosen um, by the developers of focus is really from the literature on resilience, right? So really what Dr. Walsh was just presenting some of these key elements that we know are mechanisms of resilience in families. So family members being able to, in a developmentally appropriate way, of course, understand the nature and cause of the stressor and how it, it has an impact on development and family interaction, open and emotionally re resonant communication, um, the supportive and responsive parenting, so a strong caregiver-child relationship, um, and also a strong co-parenting co or co-caregiver relationship or if there are multiple caregivers, a flexible family structure. So this sort of being able to both um, maintain continuity in the face of adversity, but also the capacity to accommodate change. And then finally, the ability to make sense of an experience and endow it with meaning and, and to really be able to do this as a family. Um, so there, there's a um, review that I've cited down here by um, uh, Saltzman and colleagues um, from 2011 that it reviews, sort of reviews some of this, this literature and as well as sort of talking about how um, this theoretical work has been sort of infused into the development of the FOCUS program. So um, these are the, the FOCUS skills that, you know, from, from the literature, um, the program focuses on, <laughs> FOCUS and FOCUS. Um, so the first is managing feelings or emotion regulation. So of course, coming from my, my graduate school work at Penn State, I was very excited to be working 
um, with a team that, that really had this emphasis on emotion regulation at the level of the family, as well as communication, goal setting, problem solving, and coping with reminders. So this would be trauma reminders or stress reminders or loss reminders. Um, the development of focus um, and, and sort of foundational research, it was developed um, from a collaboration of teams at, at UCLA um, and Harvard Children's Hospital, or Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and so it sort of, um, it, it was developed um, kind of people who had worked with three well-established family level preventive interventions. So these were all family-centered interventions um, that worked with families that had some specific type of adversity. So one was for families where there was a parent who had depression. One was for um, families with medically ill parents and their children. Um, and one was um, for families that had experienced war and community violence. And so the intention here was to sort of like figure out what are the, the core elements, like the core active ingredients of these interventions, all of which had, you know, research support um, and can we create um, a program that will sort of be um, not necessarily specific to one type of adversity, right? But that could be used for a variety of different types of family adversities. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go into what it actually looks like in just a minute. Um, but I'll say that so far, um, you know, the, the research and evaluation support um, shows um, overall support for long-term positive impact of focus on um, parental symptoms of depression, anxiety, and PTSD, child mental health symptoms, and other aspects of social emotional functioning, including pro-social functioning. I think um, we talk a lot about strengths in, in, um, in kind of implementing the focus intervention. So I think it's also important that when we talk about our outcomes, we're thinking about what are some of the, that we're not only talking about a reduction in symptoms, but we're also talking about increases or maintenance in, in sort of developmentally um, appropriate or positive behaviors. Um, family functioning, parenting behavior, child engagement with parent. Um, we have some parent reported data on this, as well as some um, uh, observational data on this. Um, and some of this work has been, um, some, of, some of this research comes from large scale evaluation of focus, um, actually across um, military connected families. It's been implemented at many um, US military sites, um, as well as um, uh, in a randomized control trial that was done um, data were collected starting in 2014 um, of civilian dwelling military families. Um, and then we also have some ongoing projects that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but we've also found so far, we have some preliminary data suggesting that we don't see um, differences in intervention effects um, when looking at outcomes for families who identify as Hispanic or Latinx. That was about 40% of our RCT sample. Um, and actually, the one place where we did see a difference, we actually saw more positive outcomes for, um, for Latina mothers. So that's sort of an exciting um, area of research that we're continuing to work on. But let me talk a little bit about what it is. So I mentioned that as part of the development of FOCUS, um, the, the kind of intervention, the leads of these other uh, um, family-centered interventions sort of came together and tried to sort of identify what are the core elements um, of how, how these interventions are delivering these skills, these family resilient skills, um, and how can we kind of infuse that into the FOCUS program. And um, so there were four. Um, so one is family assessment and monitoring. So family's ability to sort of self-assess, um, to talk with a provider about, you know, how they're doing and also just to self-assess and monitor their progress over time. Um, to have appropriate psychoeducation and developmental guidance and just knowledge, right? Because this gets back at the idea of having an understanding of the nature and cause of a stressor and its impact. Skill building activities. So um, the five skills that I showed you on a previous slide and then building a family narrative. So since I only have a few minutes today, I want to um, talk, give you some, talk about the narrative and give you some examples of that um, because one thing that I think when we're thinking about life course interventions, 
or something that can be applied at different points in the life course or at different points in a family's development, one thing I want to sort of point out with the FOCUS program is that, um, you know, as I said, there's versions for families with older kids, there's versions for families with um, young children, um, there are versions for couples. Um, and although the sort of delivery of some of these, the, the skills, um, the resilient skills differs, it all comes with these same core elements. So the narrative, um, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of the narrative. Um, so the basic idea for the narrative is that it is a, it, it sort of documents significant family, either time periods or significant family events. And, um, and so that goes along the bottom, as you can see, and then up and down the side, we have our feelings thermometer um, that, you know, represents different types of, you know, comfortable emotions in the green zone, all the way up into very uncomfortable emotions in the red zone. So each family member maps their emotional experience during that, um, that specific family event. Event. And I'll also say, like, you know, these aren't all negative events or red zone events. We actually try really hard, uh, focus providers, to have some green zone events on, on timelines, right? Because it's we are strengths-based and we want to look at the, the positive things that the family has done and the things that they're proud of, um, as well as the, the challenging times. Um, so you can see there's two different lines here. Um, and in this family, this Example family is a, a two caregiver family. One line represents Joe, one line re represents Catherine, and this would be um, the parent timeline. So I'll show you some variations about what that looks like across different developmental stages. Um, but first I sort of also want to, to kind of show you how this is, how it's actually implemented. So what you just saw um, was the, the caregiver timeline. And so typically um, in the focus intervention, we have some sessions with just parents or caregivers, some with just children, and then some for the whole family. So um, typically we have um, caregivers, you know, complete their own, their own narrative timeline um, just with them. And then the children will complete their own narrative timeline or time map. I'll show you a couple examples in a minute, just in a child only session. And then we'll do sort of a parent preparation session. And what that parent preparation session is, is to sort of help guide parents in, in what will be the upcoming whole family session where everybody will share their, um, their timelines. And really the idea is to provide an opportunity for, you know, practicing emotional awareness, being able to communicate emotions, to see other people's perspectives, um, and to share information. And we find that this can be really helpful um, because during stressful times, there often can be miscommunications um, or people, you know, may not kind of, caregivers might not really fully realize what their children are understanding or thinking. Um, there, so there can be lapses in communication that can really have a, a lingering impact. So the idea is that this is a time for um, families to kind of correct some of those misunderstandings and really importantly to develop um, a shared a shared meaning and what this means for their family and how they can grow and strengthen from it. Um, but we do that, you know, incrementally over time with each kind of type set of family members building their narratives and then eventually sharing. Um, so here's just the, the caregiver one again. Here's an example of a child. This was a teenager, um, I believe in early adolescence, um, who, that created their um, timeline. So it's more, you know, there's, there's a combination of the sort of more adult-like line graph type format. Um, but then there's also some drawings on there. You can tell that it was the teen who, who did the writing. Um, there's a little bit of collaging where they, they maybe um, couldn't draw a Statue of Liberty or didn't want to. Um, so you can see the sort of, the, the, they put their own take on the, on the, um, on the activity. And then here's one, um, a time map for, um, this was a five-year-old child um, so generally for, for kids who are younger, 
um, we'll work with them on more of a almost we always call it like it's almost like a Candylands type board. It's a little bit um, more artistic. It doesn't have the feelings thermometer and sort of the line graph type set up in the same way um, because younger children might have a harder time understanding that or like the sort of sequential nature of the events might not be as important. Um, but you can see we still have the sort of feeling thermometers. The different events here are um, encircled and written in different, um, in the sort of color zones of the feeling thermometer. So like this one, the new house, for example, is um, in a green box and it says new house in, in a, a, with a green marker. Dad leaving was in the orange zone. And then I know I don't have much time, so I'll just say really quickly, um, with um, for caregivers and um, their young children, we actually do things a little differently. So this would be for three to five-year-old children. Um, we don't have kids make their own time map, but what we do is we have parents reflect on their child's experience, right? Because we really are thinking about if the point here is to build emotion regulation skills and communication skills, right? If those are the family resilience skills, how do we build that in, in a three-year-old child or a four-year-old child? And so one of the ways that we think about perspective taking, right, is reflective functioning for parents of young children. Um, so we have parents reflect on their child's experience to um, complete a, a timeline for their child. Here's an actual one. It, it gets a little messy when we have a third person on there. Um, we also talk with parents about um, strategies to enhance um, their relationships with their children. So strategies for child-directed play, emotion socialization and emotion labeling, right, are ways of building skills and these skills in young children. Then this is from an ongoing study um, that I'm working on now where we're actually thinking about parents and caregivers' childhood experiences of, of trauma that might be sort of having an intergenerational impact on their, on their relationships with their children. Um, so we integrate, as you can see, kind of right next to the feelings thermometer, we integrate important experiences from the caregiver's own childhood that impact them as a parent. Um, so yeah, so ongoing. Um, so these are just some ongoing things that we're doing that study that I just talked about. We're also developing and piloting a Spanish language um, version of the intervention. And I will just acknowledge the funding and my collaborators, and I will stop there because I know I went over already. <laughs> no, thanks so much, Dr. Hijal. Um, really fascinating content from both presenters here, and I certainly want the remaining time we have here to be open to several things. So one is for all of you in the audience, please feel free to jump in into a discussion with us that can be done through chat. Feel free to, to just pop in and, and voice a question you have or a comment. I also want to provide space for the presenters to react to each other's content if that feels right. And then I certainly have some notes here where I've been tracking some things. So maybe I'll get the ball rolling because I think combined, these presentations have made a very compelling case for a focus on, on family systems if we, as we think about a, a, an optimal vehicle for promoting the health and well being of a person is thinking about this family, essentially this social convoy that traverses the life course together, which can shift and, and it can transcend a single household and it can transcend shared biology, these, these social convoys we call families, and, and how we can shore up those families to optimize the health and well-being of individual family members. And there was a comment, Dr. Walsh, I think you made about how in some cases there are challenges around um, getting or securing funding for research, for intervention research that's focused on the family, especially focused on promoting positive outcomes, right? It's the National Institutes of Health, yet sometimes um, we like to see the Ill focus on illness or pathology. Yeah. So how do we overcome that? Or what have been your experiences grappling with that? And how can we package our materials or make a case for a move in this focus on family and developing interventions, life course interventions that leverage the family to promote outcomes? What thoughts do y'all have on that? 
I could just say one thing there. I think um, the very concept of resilience is strengths in dealing with adversity. So I know there are many research uh, projects going on internationally that uh, are working with a particular type of adversity. And you can usually get funding for the adversity. So it's like with parent loss or with um, uh, effects of an earthquake. And, um, and so there may be funding available that isn't simply reducing risk. And sometimes you have to go at how can we reduce the risk for long-term um, traumatic effects and how can we promote and, and foster um, a more healthy, uh, positive life course in the aftermath. So I think if we can focus on um, different types of adversity, usually the research projects are then focused there. That's very helpful. Other thoughts on, on this, Dr. Hajal, or anyone else in attendance here? Uh, I, this is Neil Halp, and I have one question I want to ask, uh, uh, especially Dr. Walsh. Um, and that is, um, when you think about family resilience, um, can you talk a little bit about what the developmental pathways are? You know, how do you think about these transactions that take place and, in terms of building resilience developmentally over time? Because family... One of the concepts we're trying to uh, develop is this notion of family development. How do families develop? We're measuring kids, their ages and stages, but we don't necessarily have a good construct for family development and, and with a way that helps families create a narrative around their own development and what needs to happen. Can you reflect upon that a little bit from your work? Yeah, and actually I was, interested in the overlap of our two presentations. And I, I, I know Dr. Dr. Saltzman and I know the work of Lester and colleagues. Uh, so when you said focus, I wondered, oh, is that related to the focus project that I know? Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to see that it continues to uh, expand. And, and, and um, I know in my uh, meetings with, uh, with, with Bill Saltzman, he said that you know a lot of it just coalesced with the same processes that I identified. And when you talked about them too, we may use different words for them or we may cluster them differently. Um, but for instance, you just asked and one of it is um, uh, meaning making. The belief systems that families hold that have to respond to and adapt to and be changed by um, the conditions as they're changing over time. And I think that's where the life course perspective is, is so important and it's missing in so much research because you may get funding for an immediate response, whether it's an earthquake or, or, or a death of a parent or um, a, a crisis event. And it's very difficult to get funding to follow families over time. Uh, Dr. Rowland's work on uh, chronic illness and disability is very good in, in talking about how um, family, um, ch family challenges are going to be changing, ebbing and flowing over time so that the strengths that a family needs at the beginning in a crisis phase, and this would be true um, in any crisis, that you have to rally, pull together, and you know, be very tightly knit and put other things to the side. But those strengths could become more dysfunctional over time when people have to attend to other matters and other affairs. So what we really need to do is have good research that tracks families as they adapt over time to changing conditions. Uh, so it is, and oftentimes we see graphs about individual resilience and it's kind of something happens and then how do they respond? They go down, they go across, they go down a little and come up again. But that in real life, I think your point is more likely there are going to be changes required over time as maybe let's say with an illness that there's a remission and you go back to more of a normal 
or then there's a recurrence or there is other, other family matters that come into play or other members needs that, that shoot up that weren't part of the original. And I think to me that that's part of the complexity of family life that also uh, many researchers kind of, they tiptoe away and they say, well, there's just too much going on in the family. And to me, that's, that's life and part of it is the messiness of it, but if we can do what you're suggesting and have better, and I think that's where um, uh, we're, I think we need more um, qualitative interviews that are longitudinal over time. Uh, Emmy Werner was, she's one of my heroes. You may know of her work in social sciences and one of the first people looking at resilience uh, in children and then tracking them they, first in adolescence, then in young adulthood, then in middle life, or at least coming back to them. And I, I hope to see more longitudinal research. Todd, I just had a quick uh, question for Nastasha, and I love both the presentations. I think they've been really informative. Um, I just wondered in an intervention like FOCUS, is it easy to engage all the family members? Because I could imagine it, it's a fairly you know, emotionally demanding process. Is it a little easier to engage the mums, a bit more challenging to engage the, the fathers? Or could you give me a picture about engaging all, all the family, like teenagers, for example? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, and, you know, I think it, it really depends. <laughs> it depends on the family, of course, as it always does. But, you know, I think with focus, the I, idea is to work at the level of the family, right? And, and really like the, I think the emphasis that we try to make is that each individual family member has, you know, a, a major impact on the functioning of the family as a whole. Um, so I think it also probably depends on treatment um, or intervention setting, right? If you have families like presenting for a preventive intervention um, versus coming into um, like a, a clinic because maybe they have a lot, you know, already going on or have or already experiencing some pretty significant symptoms. Um, there is variation, but we've definitely, we've engaged multiple caregiver families, right? With both, you know, both like moms and dads. Um, we have some, I know like with our um, current study, um, we have some dads who have participated, right? Where it's just the dad participating and, and not the mom. Um, we've also worked with families where there is another, you know, like a relative caregiver. So not necessarily a mom and a dad, but maybe one parent and one grandparent um, or other family member. I think in general, you know, we have a lot of um, sort of like a focus on activities and practice of skills and home activities. So what we'll often do is, um, you know, if, if there's only one caregiver that's able to attend, because sometimes it's really just about scheduling demands, um, we'll try to work with, um, you know, one caregiver to, to be able to share the information um, we'll try to work with family schedules in terms of engaging kids and teens. I mean, I think generally because it, it's a fairly short term intervention, I think that children or teens who might be more likely to disengage, um, can sort of see the benefit of, you know, engaging for a few sessions to be able to better communicate with their parents um, or talk about their needs in a way that their parents might hear, right? That's really like kind of how, how the provider is helping to support them. So um, yeah, it varies of course, but I think kind of the nature of the intervention sort of helps us be able to engage all family members, even if there's some hesitation or difficulty. Excellent. Well, thank you all again so much. I'm cognizant of, of the time. So just another uh, warm expression of gratitude for all of you who are able to join us for this webinar. Uh, very grateful for our two excellent presenters. So grateful that, that both of you were willing to share your time with us this afternoon and share with us uh, the details of your work. And so um, 
I believe this recording will be made available soon on, on YouTube. And so it's something that folks uh, should feel free to revisit later on in the future. And I hope folks are able to join us for our next webinar, which is actually kind of sneaking up on us. I believe it's going to be next week on Friday, November 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And that's going to be focused on the topic of parents as drivers of systems change. And so we hope to see you all then. Thank you again. We hope you have a great rest of the day.